and we finished our the, the program basically uh, like 15 days ago. So to be able to do like but a I'm robust sure, contextual sure. material. I'm sure you didn't finish everything that was 15 days no, ago. But no, I mean, what we had was, you know, some things were, were yeah. clear a year out. Other things fell into place yeah. maybe six months in. And I always kept space for the things that I might see yeah. last minute that, that needed to be there because uh, it was important. It was in that year's edition. Of course. Spring Dance was only every two years, mm -hmm. so I didn't want to be right. missing Good things. Idea. Um, but it meant you had a good sense of a lot of the program uh, ahead of time. And maybe we had, I don't know, four-month lead-in time for commissioning essays and, and producing the thing. Yeah. But we commissioned the artwork too. I mean, it was, I mean, it was, a, it was a whole production on, on, on its own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but a lot of the, en the essays were more about where the field was at the time. I mean, remember, Spring Dance was looking at dance and performance, so it was... And I was in the programming constantly questioning mm -hmm. what that form, form itself was and the way yeah. artists were breaking it. So a lot of the work was trying to frame yeah. the work generally as mm -hmm. opposed to each specific show. Uh, but of course, we then had all the pages on the shows themselves that had to have all the accurate information. And that's the last thing you do. But... Uh, but this is, of course, a really important distinction with the visual. I mean, that's why uh, visual arts and time-based arts are apples and oranges in that regard, that uh, sometimes the productions aren't finished uh, in time for even <laughs> opening, uh, opening week. Uh, so it's hard, it's hard to prepare these kinds of materials in, uh, in advance, right? But maybe that's an argument for trying to do it uh, afterwards as some kind of critical evaluation, mm -hmm, documentation right, exactly. project yeah. uh, that would bring a kind of closure to... Um, yeah, to... I think we should be doing that a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, as a festival, we, you know, we don't have the resources or the people to do that. By the time we finish this one, we're programming next. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget's gone, you know, and, and so it would mean <laughs> like we'd have to do less things yeah. Or, yeah. or fewer things in order that we could do then the archiving. And that's a, a big uh, issue. You know, right. Are you really... Are you really going to support one one less artist in order to do a big archive for everything else? I mean, that's a big uh, problem. Uh, so actually, I just want to ask you on this point, and then maybe we'll open up to questions and move from the panel form to the participatory form. Uh, maybe what kinds of things you would like to do? I mean, imagine that, that uh, someone dropped from the sky and said, Simon, uh, I will give you the equivalent of one project's budget uh, to, do, um, uh, to do a documentary Project. What what form would it take? What would you uh, what would you like to do that you can't do because uh, you're under resourced in this capacity? What I'd like is because all the projects are really very different and seek to engage really in different ways. Would be to have effectively an an archivist um, in a different kind of in a different form attached to each project. So maybe there's a you know there's a writer, there's a visual artist, maybe there's a photographer, maybe there's another a choreographer or a theater. So in other words. Each piece develops uh, an archive piece, mm -hmm. which can then be assembled uh, sometimes performatively, sometimes uh, uh, in, a, in published format, sometimes online. But so that there's a, it begins a dialogue. And uh, I mean, what we tend, what we tried to do in, in the festival was connect. We felt it was important if a lot of artists were coming into the city, um, that they had a, a relationship to the the artist community here. So we we often set up uh, brunches or just meetings between the visiting artists and the artists in the city. Not public at all, but really where there could be a, an open conversation uh, and a more social event. But that did lead to uh, connections sometimes to do with more actually often accommodation abroad. You know, you people would go and stay with people, but it, it also could lead to projects. And I think those kind of things are really generative for the, for the community here. And, and more of that, I think, is really a vital role that we as festivals need to take on. Mm -hmm. So it's two um, things. Uh, uh, I would like actually really good documentation, like OTB style, like three camera of everything. Mm. That's more than one project's uh, uh, budget. Uh, that's the whole project. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's the entire festival's so no budget. festival, just good Just movies. good documentation yeah. of like nothing. <laughs> um, uh, and then the other, the other thing is uh, a, a new um, project I'm starting with uh, Andy and, and CultureBot, the, the new leadership in CultureBot, is this, so I've been thinking, um, we are talking about the state of writing and how it's, it's really reviews, thumbs up, thumbs down, and then 
where is the critical discourse in like plain language? Where is that living in, in, in a sense? And so one of the things that we're going to start uh, this, this year is to um, work with a group of writers from CultureBot and kind of be at the press core of, of, of Under the Radar. And perhaps that could sort of work with the other festivals. But really, the other thing that I was thinking was, I actually want artists to write about other artists' work. Mm -hmm. To provide that context, to provide right. that relationship and that conversation, for me, that is the most interesting than something that is sort of ordered and thematic, but really a conversation between artists and how they work and what is their process. Um, so if I had, you know, whatever that money was, how to change that culture of, uh, of, of um, because as a director, unless I'm the best friends with the other director, I'm not going to really go deep, deep, deep into what their work did not work. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. But how do you create that sort of space in which to have a very um, uh, 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 collaborative conversation mm -hmm. about the work? Mm -hmm. And I think that just how to get that cadre of writers so that we're not depending on reviewers, and I don't use the word critics, reviewers that determines how the work is seen or, you know. So. And I imagine that's particularly important as the public moves more and more into a devised commissioning program. Meaning? Uh, meaning that uh, uh, opening up that space that you're talking about is only more important as, uh, as you do more and more of this, mm -hmm. well, as you do more and more of this kind of work, uh, having that kind of process for extending the dialogue yeah. would be important. Process to like extend the, extending the dialogue and opening up the conversation is always, you know, a good thing. Um, so many of these, many of you guys' ideas too are things that we've talked about in our kind of dreamland of if we, if we have more resources. Um, so in the publishing, we would like to be able to give the script to everyone who comes to the theatre because it also serves as a program. It has all the company bios in, so we would like to just be able to give them away um, because so much of our work, you know, people go away and then read and get all this other context just um, experiencing it as a text. So we'd like to do that. We've done some commissioning of artists to write about other artists' work. For example, when we worked with Daniel Alexander-Jones, we commissioned Issa Davis to write um, about his work, and it was wonderful. So we would like to be doing that for like every single show. Um, and then we'd really want to be pushing more into these participatory workshops for every project that we work on, and also having some sort of bigger annual um, events at the theatre that, you know, these creativity workshops that people can come and, and be part of and sort of have like different thematic things, whether it's musical writing, whether it's the some artists who've been talking to me about trans work and having a whole kind of festival um, and uh, workshop series on, um, on that work. So, you know, I think really pushing into the participatory work as a way of cracking open the the plays that we're doing. Those are the kind of two areas that if someone wanted to shower money on us, <laughs> we, would, we would be ready to do. And then more of the sort of off-site partnerships, the ones we've done with museums have been successful, but we haven't really been able to market them, you know, and just like tell people about them because we've had no dedicated money for that. So the goal of them is to really like extend the work beyond, you know, um, the people who are already coming. And so I think putting more resource behind that would really maximize and amplify the impact that those offsite, you know, we've done like walking tours, we've done these museum things. They've been great that like, I would like for them to be a bigger part of our programming. Mm -hmm. So yeah. dreams and aspirations seems like a good uh, point to break the conversation <laughs> open. Break it. Uh, and I see uh, a number of uh, distinguished uh, um, presences here in our audience. So maybe uh, if you can just identify yourself uh, before you ask your question and um, quickly and say if you're, uh, if you're a, a, a theater maker yourself or a theater professional, cultural uh, professional in some way, uh, that would be useful uh, context so we can know what do we have participative lighting also? And we have, yeah, it's quite hard for us to see here, so maybe we could bring up the house lights a little bit so we can all see each other. Oh, and wow. if, you, if you can use wow. the microphone Marvelous. as well. Also, this is part of the live stream, so if you could just hold that microphone right up there. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think it's a very important discourse that's going on. My name is Beate Hein Bennett. I actually tried to teach, and I did teach dramaturgy, 
in the late 70s when there was hope for, re for regional repertory theaters at Virginia Commonwealth University. We had a very nice program. And coming from the background of German theater as a young person, I modeled more or less the program on production dramaturgy, which dealt exactly with the idea of creating for the audience in a, in an enter, in a way entertaining, not, not a hardcore academic jargon rich uh, con discourse, but the context of the production that the audience was going to see. And we also had some sometimes post discussion, post performance discussions. So this was in the late 70s uh, uh, to the mid 80s. And then I came to New York and project by project, I worked every now and then, but I taught most of the time in the public school system, I want to say. <laughs> and we brought children to the theater. And one of the things that was missing, uh, except for TDF had a very particular program where directors were taking on a group of students and actually shepherded them through a production, or at least through a performance, and it was wonderful. Now, in terms of expanding the discourse and this very, very marvelous uh, ideas that floated up here, um, I think part of, the, uh, you, you, part of the problem, as I see it, and I would like to raise that question, is the theater culture uh, in this country uh, lives in different Lay, social layers. There is, first of all, there is the layer of theater as entertainment industry. And the word industry already creates a certain slot. Secondly, the, point, the term was brought up that it is per, often seen as elitist, and that has to do with the cost of admission. And thirdly, it is seen often as um, uh, how shall I say, as pure entertainment, diversion. I'm coming to be diverted, and I've paid a lot of money, and so I better be diverted. Um, the context is not so important. So you have theater programs that are given away that all they have are these bios. Um, and that is what is expected. In Germany, you have theater programs that are sold. You have to buy the program, and it is chock full of contextual material. People buy them. And people do buy them. So my question is, how can the theater institution and institutions such as the Soho Rep, which work on a certain budget, and that budget is very hard to allocate into everything. What are you thinking about, um, how do you finance, in fact, because it always comes down to that, how do you finance or how can you finance or how can you allocate resources um, to create, um, uh, or do you see, to create all these contextual uh, not embellishments, but uh, enrichments. I mean... Sorry I, sorry, I took a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, you said it. You need to fundraise for it. Um, you know, after Philoctetes, I fundraised $200,000 to start this program because I felt like it was really important. Um, and to go to this next level, we would need to raise hundreds of thousands more dollars, which is something that we, we want to do. We're also trying to raise artist fees. We're also trying to do, you know, three productions that are often huge casts and huge designs, and we want to do four. And so it's a constant balancing act of where our fundraising muscle goes, but it's on our, like, short wish list of projects that we want to fundraise for. So it's a very fundable project. It's just, it's a lot of pavement pounding and articulating the idea. But, you know, I, I fundraised initially at the theater specifically for this work because I felt like it was very important. But I, can I just respond? I mean, a, more, a more general point, but I think it's important as 
as presenters of work, we also start to uh, dismantle this notion of the institution that you talk about, that the work we're presenting increasingly becomes part of it, the, the dialogue itself, so the, the way the artists are working or what we're commissioning. So when we, we're moving away from the idea that there's these finite products, you know, these, these shows that we need to market and then contextualize, that we start to really mm -hmm. uh, bring those things together. And then you can, it's not about raising a separate budget, it's about saying this commission will be a piece that is a very uh, interactive, mm -hmm. engaged piece, which will connect with people in, in a different way. And I think mm -hmm. that's the only way we're going to start to break all of this down. I mean, this is, of course, a very um, progressive uh, sector of the larger American theater. Uh, when we, and we're up against a lot of very anti-intellectual theater culture and uh, theater culture that mostly does uh, encourage people to uh, come in and regard the production as a kind of art object and leave, right? So we have yeah. those habits are ingrained even when I'm they come it, over to your if, if we're following the industry model, we're not going to in any way start to challenge it. Right. Um, we need to start with what we're doing that starts to create different kinds of experiences in the theater. Yeah. And it starts then to erode away at the idea that there's this institutional model that we all have to follow because mm -hmm. really we don't. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Uh, Claudia. Hi, I'm Claudia Case. I'm a CUNY theater professor. I would like to know um, what are some digital strategies that you're currently using or that you're thinking about in order to foster the kind of public engagement we're talking about and critical discourse among your audience members? You're looking at me. <laughs> um, uh, we are probably quite 20th century. Uh, still with our uh, digital initiatives. Uh, but Under the Radar had its 10th uh, anniversary, the last uh, festival. And one of the big sort of 10-year projects was actually to do an uh, archive of all of the shows that we've ever done with some contextual material like interviews or reviews that sort of came with it, um, uh, videos. We asked um, the artists to contribute like uh, 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 their uh, research material or anything that gives context, like from the artist's voice gives context to the shows. So we have that online at Under the Radar, history at undertheradarfestival.com. Um, other than that, uh, we are, you know, we, we are starting, we need to have a larger strategy about how to use the digital, um, because right now it's kind of piecemeal. So we're talking about social media, we're talking about Tumblr, I mean, it's, it's actually like really basic stuff. And one of the big goals is to actually be very strategic and within a larger structure, which is the public theater, because they also have to. Because as a program within the public, there's a lot of different programs, and now everybody is doing it in a very different way. Like uh, Joe's Pub is quite progressive, and that everything is live streamed and is music, so it's it's for me is easier. Um, but they're very good at making the stuff accessible online and being tagging and cross referencing the fantastic music that they do. So. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> no, and for Crossing Line, ours is still really linked either to marketing, so it's about using social media to kind of alert people and to kind of create little kind of uh, catalyzing moments of interest, or it's archiving things that we have been able to, to document, which are usually not... Is it true? Yeah, it's, us it's more the discussions and the things that are easy to film because it's, mm -hmm. it's usually, you know, the, the one or sometimes two cameras, but <laughs> it's, the, it's the simple things to document that make sense to see on a screen because a lot of the work we're presenting wouldn't really be easy to document to be then viewed on a screen. And we're, you know, we're in a sense resisting that a little bit that there are events that you experience in a, in, you know, in a real analog way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not just easily transferable to digital. But um, it, we have had projects that can engage people in different ways um, where you can have people uh, sending in elements to it. But uh, again, it, it's actually a huge human resource question. You need people who are dealing with that all the time uh, and not doing other things. Otherwise, it's out of date. It's not managed. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really a big uh, resourcing issue. We, we would like to do more because we feel it's an important part of the way in which we can connect a much broader range of people to some of the projects. Again, not all of them. Um, but to work with the right artist in the right way with the, an infrastructure that can support it uh, would be ideal, but we're a long way from achieving that yet. Other questions? Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Susanna. I'm, um, I research Russian theater. And I was wondering if, um, you know, if the, the sort of audience input and talkbacks are ever predicated upon by um, types of plays. Um, for instance, I would think that a docudrama, a documentary play, would probably elicit input from the audience. I mean, documentary plays are um, usually based on current events, scandalous events in the news. And so I was wondering if any of you have experience producing documentary plays, docudramas, with this type of structure um, and with the goals of, of audience input or talkbacks after the production? And if so, if, okay, well then if not, how, how would you, for instance, and would, would you want to embrace that project? And if you would, how, did you, do you have any ideas of how you might Contextualize the, like that. Yeah. Contextualize the, um, I mean, we've done a fair bit of, uh, well, some uh, so-called documentary dramas. So we did, we presented Lola Arias last year in terms of she took the, the stories of um, 11 performers uh, whose parents were on the left and the right uh, spectrum of, of uh, the war, basically, and then she made it into a play. Um, and it's about Pinochet's Chile, right? Yeah. It, it, yes. Uh, she's an Argentinian... Um, uh, writer-director who did a version of that um, ba um, in Argentina, and then Chile has invite, invited her to work sort of the same format, um, inviting uh, people uh, who are not necessarily actors to come in to um, speak on the, to, to work on the piece. And then we've done Belarus Free Theater, where uh, they are definitely sort of taking examples and transcripts and stories from uh, their real life experience in, in Minsk and Belarus and bringing it into, um, making it into play form, very, very powerful ensemble physical theater. Um, and, you know, uh, we did a show uh, called Silver Stars uh, from Ireland, which was the songs uh, sung by um, older um, uh, gay men who uh, were uh, sort of Grew up in a grew up in, or were were adults in a time that um, it was very difficult for them to come out basically, and so they were like all, all gentlemen in their fifties, sort of telling the story and singing the story of um, being gay in Ireland, the experience of it. Uh, so, in that case, it's actually the 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 most simplest and moving thing is to like have a talk back for for um, for for the audience to actually ask the actual real questions of these real people and. Um, there's, there's very little um, uh, 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 veils, basically. So it's just an open, open conversation. And for, for that, that's usually been the most successful. So we, it's a moderated uh, discussion. I must say that, um, to add a critical note, that uh, it's, a, it's, a big pro it's a very thorny problem with documentary mm -hmm. performance work, theater, uh, documentary theater. And I'm surprised sometimes that those talkbacks, because of the culture of affirmation that Shannon Jackson is talking about, that permeates those post-show discussions. We're here to applaud the actors who are sitting on stage who have just uh, been sweating and working for us. Uh, that uh, it's hard uh, to have a, a conversation in that moment, maybe questioning uh, some of the choices that the documentary theater makers have made, what you left in, what you took out, parts of the story that were neglected or retold or reshaped. Uh, and I often, don't, I often miss that space uh, in those discussions, particularly about documentary theater. How do we, uh, how do we where's our space to question um, what we've just seen on stage or to um, not just accept at face value the events as depicted? Uh, you were at those top facts, you didn't ask. I, <laughs> 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 yeah, but then I would be the baddie in the room. And I, All right. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, question. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. But, but frankly, I don't think it, it's really any different from a talkback after another piece, another piece of performance. Yeah. It's a performance with a whole bunch of people who've just done something mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to be a place where something more is revealed, right. frankly. Right. But I think a project that takes you know, an artist into a, into a community. We, we worked with a Brazilian artist called Bel Borba um, two years ago. Um, and the project was that he would build an artwork every day in a different part of the city in all five boroughs using what he found there. Um, so he only ran into trouble with the police twice, but mostly uh, it was conversation with people whose neighborhood he was in 
asking him what he's doing. And it began all kinds of conversations about the, you know, the relationship to the space you're in, how you use things, what, why is something deemed to be rubbish, about recycling. It was just fantastically rich conversations that he had by the very act of being in a different place each day, making an artwork with what he found. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually a much, a much richer way of getting to the relationship between someone's view of the world and, and how an artist can, can um, engage with that in a conversation than against you know, staging a piece in a theater where there's all the etiquette about how you behave. We have time for one final question. Sorry. There should be one more question, but one thing. Um, Anne Catania, who's the dramaturg from Lincoln Center Theater, asked me to uh, give ev even every one of you one of those brochures. The Lincoln Center uh, put out this theater review. They commissioned up to 16 um, writers, sociologists, uh, journalists, artists to make contributions that have nothing to do as a review of the play, but with the context. And um, they do this, I think, two times a year and put them out there for free. You know, a tremendous amount of work goes into there into that, so it's an interesting model. I will um, give it out to you. So my question to piggyback on yours was the digital initiative. A website now uh, on WordPress is like 50 bucks. Um, why couldn't uh, every theater have uh, a, a WordPress site where you ask you know, 16 people, friends, uh, collaborators, steal some French philosophy, give context. You will never be able to compete with uh, the marketing machine of uh, Wicked, but a great website, a small one, you know, you will be outperformed with very little resources. Anybody else and people will understand the process or document the process. I think this could be a solution to really have a dramaturg who is then will be also part of the outreach in a smart way mm -hmm. to justify dramaturg, work on it, but also have an outreach, but provide a lasting um, a memory also of a process and documentation. And context, I bet a lot of New York writers or artists would be thrilled to participate in the um, South Africa, uh, you know, Debbie Tucker Green play and make ongoing contribution, and it should, it's not just, uh, I think, money and manpower, but it's something that also a new audience will really react to, I think, and would be a strong um, contribution. But um, just to say, there should be one, I'd, I didn't want to take away any questions. I'd, I'd, my, just my counter position is that we all read so much online already. You know, if everyone is doing a blog about everything they're doing, it's a very narrow notion of, of archive and response, and I think, we need to be commissioning a much broader range of <laughs> engagement. That's, that's all I would say. Yeah. I just don't need more blogs. Frankly. Yeah. Well, there's also it's, it's an interesting point also because it raises the uh, the prospect of this documentary process as a um, maybe even as a training um, opportunity for critics, for example, uh, who yeah. might learn. Uh, to uh, see work differently by being embedded in its creation over time and documenting it, that ultimately uh, those kinds of assignments would uh, broaden their own critical sensibility. Yes. We were thinking about. Yeah. Um, well, this seems like a place to stop. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got one last question. Yeah. Um, my name is Mary Gorman, and I'm a theater professional, but I'm also a student here in the Graduate Center. Um, I, I, my question is, it's, it almost seems like uh, the gorilla in the room which is, you're talking about writing, and you're talking about, um, as producers and directors, uh, doing incredible things to try to make uh, the theater work. And, you know, it is the art of the human being, as uh, Barreau said. And do you have, my question is, do you have any kind of concern about the quality of acting that we have in this country? and what's happened with that. And uh, that, that's what, you know, if you look at um, the work of, of Stanislavski wanting to make the audience purge their emotions through a subjective approach of the acting, or Barak to uh, devised a way that the acting would be objective to make the audience, uh, you know, leave the theater and do something about what they saw. That those, that that's the medium. The medium is really acting, and there's a big problem with it. The question is, do they see a problem with it? No, do you see a problem with the acting in this country? Do you see a problem? When we see European theater, there isn't much of a problem. You I know? think it's a slightly... <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> 
uh, it's slightly off. I can show you. <laughs> it's slightly off topic for this conversation, which, uh, but I think is an important question to be addressed uh, and probably deserves its own evening. Uh, this is a, this uh, is something a, really very specific. Andy and I are actually talking about one of the culture bot sessions, talking about what is acting nowadays in this field and mm -hmm. and the histories of it. From Richard Maxwell, apparent is like uh, publishing a new book from Stanislavski to Richard Maxwell's like neutral uh, neutral acting space. What is going on in the field? I'm not talking about the problems, but what are the trends and what are, is it moving towards? Mm -hmm. There's a conversation that we're and having. Changed, There's a scholarly conversation rapidly. happening around that as well and looking at uh, oh, evolutions cool. of Western philosophy alongside uh, the permutations of the Western theater. And that would be great to connect uh, in that dialogue as well when we've broadened the discourse using <laughs> all of these tools and tricks. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining uh, me today in this experiment. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you.